Thanks. Thanks, guys, for inviting me. Um, I have, I don't know, I'll take about 40 minutes or so. Um, kind of a different style presentation. I wanted to talk a little bit about um, kind of what personalization means to, to me in particular, but to Yahoo, kind of how we're approaching it, how it fits in with, with what we've been doing. And then a little bit uh, maybe towards the latter half on um, kind of on the science side and engineering side, what we're doing about that. So it's kind of a mix. I'm not getting too detailed in any particular thing. It's kind of fun, I think. Um, so, indeed, intro to media, um, talk about traditional and digital media, what's the difference between them, um, why are we failing when I say we, um, I, I mean really Yahoo, but I mean in general, um, the supplies, um, and then kind of personalization and new media. It's good if I walk around, guys, right? You, you don't need to, yeah. Um, so this is just kind of fun. Um, we're at a university, so we all recognize this guy. Um, we, know, we know who he is. We know what he says, right? This is the guy. That's what he says. Um, most everyone also knows this guy. And it's interesting that that's the case, in fact, right? Um, that these two guys are, are about as well known um, as can be. And this guy says a different thing, right? It's about user experience. And, um, you know, Steve Jobs, he believes in fundamentals, but he believes in fundamentals about the user more than anything else. Um, and I believe this to be fully true. Um, and um, really... Um, what, what, what I'm most interested in, what, what Yahoo really is interested in for sure today is bringing these two together. So we want to drive um, the user experience to be better. We want users to come back. Um, but we also want to do this in a fundamental, scalable way. We don't just want to throw a hack up or, or do something. We want to do it right, um, yes, from the beginning, but we don't want to slow down. So in the beginning, maybe we'll do some hacks, but we'll move, we'll move, we'll move, and we'll iterate, and we'll get to the fundamentals. So it's really about both. So what does that mean um, here? So everything starts with math and science theory if you want to do fundamentals. Um, but very soon, you need to get to the practice of it, right? Um, the theory essentially never works in practice, right? So you get, really need to get down to what is that application? How am I going to get there? Um, but that's not enough um, because ultimately I need to implement this thing in some existing um, technology, languages, or you know, maybe, um, maybe it'll cost an exorbitant amount of money to do something new you know, across the globe, so I want to use existing systems. So there's this third layer of application that comes. Um, and kind of, say I want to do Gaussian mixture models, probably everyone here knows what that is. Um, yes, it's theory, actually, right? I mean, um, I didn't even say finite Gaussian mixture models, right? And if I actually want to do that at scale, I can't just take the thing right out of, out of my paper that I published when I was at school. I have to do something special, right? I gotta do LSH, plus I gotta do binning, and I gotta do some cosine similarity stuff. And then at the end, I gotta cluster things around. And when I've done that, now I've actually estimated kind of Gaussian mixture models. And, and the middle thing I can do at scale. I can do billions of things. I can um, even do this online real time, in fact. The thing up there, I can't. There's no easy way to do it. And then I need to implement this in some technology that either we have today or that's easy for me to create. Um, for example, this thing here is a very scalable search engine that we have at Yahoo. I can use that to do various things, indexing to make it faster. This thing called Yell here is actually a fully scalable, internationalizable thing. I can run over text in any, any language I want to and extract very similar things out in a similar way. Um, and so essentially I can use bits and pieces of technology that I have and plug them into other pieces that i got to create brand new. Um, and so kind of we have to go through these three steps every time we want to do something, something new, really. So, um, so media. So I'm talking about media. So what is media? Media is a lot of things. Media is like a CD that you have. You know, media is kind of a media player. Media is organizations. Uh, media is you know an ecosystem. Um, for Yahoo, I like to think of it as kind of uh, a business, an ecosystem more. Um, so we have lots of media content. We have news articles. We have Flickr images. We have lots of other things. Um, and Yahoo has lots of users interested in that, right? And so media to me is is you know, this matching. How do we take that content, how do we give it to, to our users? And, and, and this is what I'm calling media. I mean, in general, it applies, you know, since we've had information and users who wanted it, going all the way back. Um, so really, it's about, to me, content recommendation, if I boil it down. There's many other problems that, that you're going to have to solve to get to this stage. Um, for example, I got to deal with metrics. I got to do, I mean, in, in the digital world, I have pages. I want to optimize the page. I got to understand the content. I got to do information retrieval. I got to deal with trends. Lots of other sub problems. But at the end of the day, 
it's all towards this media problem, which is recommending content to the users. And, and before we heard about information need, that's a type um, of, of this game. There's, there's other ones when I don't have an information need, but I still want to consume content. Um, so this slide is kind of fun. It's kind of what is the, what is the scale of media on the internet? Um, it's pretty dramatic compared to what traditional media used to deal with. So these things are all in the order of, um, and they're reasonably close um, for this whole slide. So Yahoo, you're on the order of a billion users, which is quite a lot. Um, it's got on the order of hundreds of billions of page views, just page views per month. Um, that's, that's also quite a lot. Before we were talking a little bit about sketches. Um, yeah, sketches can apply to a lot of these things. Um, we have billions of items to recommend. Um, you know, articles, videos, photos, answers, updates. You know, the more I add, the more this gets crazy. Um, what's, what's amazing, there's millions new every single day, um, which we'll see when we compare to other problems, this is not the case. Um, so it's fun. So comparisons, these are mostly public stats um, for the most part, and they're mostly accurate again. Um, they're on the order. So Netflix has 30 million people. Dramatically different, right? Um, but, but still, that's close enough. Um, they have less than 200,000 titles. That's definitely different. And there's hundreds new, maybe. That's nothing. Right? I mean, hundreds to millions is a totally different type of problem. Maybe there's, I don't know how many hundreds new there is, but there's just not that many. Um, but nonetheless, still interesting problem. Pandora, similar. And you know, I picked these guys just because I like them, I use them, um, and because they do this area, right? This is the kind of area they work in, and, and if you ask someone to name them, they'd come up with these, these, these companies. Um, Amazon, they have about, probably on the order of, a little bit more actually physically than 200 million accounts, but not that many more. Um, they have 50 million products, which is a lot. Um, turns out, you know, as, as we know, Amazon is a tail machine. So lots of these products, um, maybe not many people are buying. Um, and, you know, they get thousands new every day. Um, I don't know how many, um, but pretty close, which is pretty big. Um, so we go down to the next thing, Google News, which starts to get to a level at which that I'm operating at. So Google News, on average, has about a billion users per month, a billion uniques, basically. They have about six billion page views per month. I don't know exactly what the number is. And there's hundreds of thousands of new articles that they're dealing with every day. Um, that number can go up or down depending on what you classify as a news article and what Google News wants to do tomorrow, for example. But it's, it's close. It's reasonably close. Um, if you look at YouTube, um, it's more. It's very similar to um, what, what we have to be looking at in personalization. And Yahoo, same sort of thing. Billion, billion, and billion. Very close. Um, so you can see that uh, the scale matters a lot in um, what you can do and how you can do it. Um, if I got to deal with a billion new things or however many new things every month or every day, then all my algorithms have to change. Um, so challenges due to scale. Um, so we have a billion content items. Um, so we have to somehow extract kind of identical signals from all these media types. Otherwise, I can't very easily build a single system that knows how to deal with all of them at the same time. They don't have to be exactly identical, but pretty close. Um, and you can imagine extracting, I can extract a lot of stuff from blogs or news articles, um, but then when I go to tweets, you know, it becomes very different. Tweets sometimes point to articles, so that helps. Um, there's lots of tweets, some of them are garbage. Structured content is totally different than all these other things, so maybe I, you, you know, like a certain company and you want to see when they hire a new CEO. Well, it's structured content, I want to recommend that, that to you as well. Um, nothing like a news article, but I have to kind of extract the same sort of signals from it. Um, and because I have lots of them, it becomes tricky. If I finally had to do this for a, a few things across a few of those types, it's much easier. If you've got to do it for lots of them across lots of types, it becomes very tricky. Um, the other thing is um, I have too many things, right? So I need to predict quality. And automatically, that's the only way I can do it. Um, automatically predicting quality in general is, is pretty damn tricky. Um, <clears throat> and it's hard at that scale. Um, the other thing is implementing tiering. So I have too many things. I can't possibly, probably look at all of them all the time. And you know, you're, you're, in general, you could go your whole lifetime, and if I take any snapshot of those things, you may not care about 89% of them ever. So why the hell do I have to look at all of them for you? So you want to come up with some interesting tiering method where I only look at certain tiers for certain use cases for certain people in certain contexts. Um, 
obviously I want to understand how these things go together. So which images go with which articles go with which tweets. Putting them together, together is a way to segment this problem. So now there's less of things, plus um, it helps you extract similar signals from all these things. You can extract from groups of things instead of individuals. Um, blending and ranking. So, you know, if you had to do this, if tomorrow, you know, you said, hey, I have a new stream of articles and I want to put um, images in there. Um, the very first thing you do is blending, right? You'd say, hey, I have news articles. I already know how to do those. Let's just figure out how I put the images in there and, and we'll just slot them in somehow. Um, and that's great. Um, that's hard to scale um, because the minute I start to add other things like videos and tweets and all these other things, I need to change that, that blender over and over and over again. If I had to do this constantly, it's very expensive and very painful. Um, often blenders are done manually, it turns out. Um, unified ranking is where there's no blending. Everything goes in the same machine and it outputs a unified ranking. So this is nice, it's very scalable. Um, it's easy to add more things potentially. Um, but in the beginning it has a high cost. So you have to actually generate identical signals um, and you have to have good coverage across all the signals, across all the different things you want to do. And you have to have a unified target and you need to associate all these things with that unified target. So it becomes very, very tricky. Um, billions of users. Um, so one thing is just storing information about a billion users in quote unquote production right next to where you're gonna, where you're gonna access the content is expensive. Right? I gotta put your profile everywhere in the world because you, you might jump on a plane and show up somewhere else. Um, so you don't want to essentially, you want to have kind of compressed models in some sense. Um, the other thing is um, there's so many users that there's a significant amount of users in all stages. Um, so I can't just say, hey, let's forget all the people who I have no information about whatsoever because, you know, there's hundreds of millions of them, right? And I'm making a significant amount of money off of these users. Same with the low engaged users and the medium engaged users and the high engaged users. I have a significant population of all of them. And there's no one technique that's going to work for all these cases. Um, so that means you've got to have multiple techniques. You've got to solve this problem over and over and over five or six times, and you have to figure out how they go together. Um, so say, you know, I'm kind of a cold start user, but when do I move to low? So how do I shift from one technique to another? How do I blend these techniques together? Um, that becomes pretty tricky. Um, modeling issues. So Suppose I just want to pick one of these guys and do something. How do I do cloudward filtering in a billion by billion matrix, right? What does that even mean? That's clearly impossible. Um, so how do I actually do cloudward filtering at that scale? Um, so it's just interesting. On top of that, this, this population is changing all the time. So I got cookies that are churning all the time. So what I, I used to know, maybe you were a medium engaged user, and for some reason you're a cookie churn. Now all of a sudden you're a cold start user, and it's like I've never seen you before. Um, and that happens constantly, every second of the day. The news cycle is changing the types of stuff that, that's happening all day, every day. This is, you know, this is very hard to deal with. They're all fun things, of course. Um, and then, of course, um, you have the bottom thing, which is nice. You're getting tens of billions of new data every single day, but you've got to use them. Um, so I got people reading news articles and doing something with, with images um, so often every day, and I can't I don't really want to ignore any particular one of them because it may be the one that drives the user experience that I've missed. So um, if a user tells and says, you know, I hate, I just hate, you know, um, I don't know, I hate the USC Trojans football team. I hate them. I don't want to see anything about that team, right? Um, a good team to pick here. Um, and I miss that one. And I start showing you, I still keep showing it to you, and no matter what you do, I, I still give it to you. You're going to get upset and you're going to hate this system. And so I can't really ignore these things. Now, there's not a lot of them. Maybe, you know, every day you only have, you know, 0.2 of those. But I have to make sure I capture them, um, at least over some small amount of interaction with you. Um, and then you have the real-time requirements. So um, essentially, almost everything has to be done online and incremental. Um, you can't, users don't like to wait anymore, right? We were just talking about this early. The minute that a user can um, get something done in a minute, the very next day, that's the requirement. And if you can't do it in a minute anymore, then your system's no good. Even if the day before they were willing to wait an hour. They're no longer willing to wait an hour. Um, so you basically have to do every single thing online, um, which, you know, is, is interesting in itself. Um, but figuring out how to incrementalize your algorithm at, at this scale for all the different things you need to do um, becomes very, very hard. 
Um, and then the other thing, which is the standard real-time requirement, is the whole world is driven by trends these days. Um, everything is breaking, this is breaking, that's breaking. I heard someone say this in the airport, I think. Um, and that's, that's a problem, because the users are used to that now. And so if I have you know, some application or some product and it doesn't know how to deal with trends in some fundamental way, then this product is no good. They're going to go to another one that deals with that. Um, so kind of these are challenges in general, um, but at scale they become even, even more tricky to deal with. Um, so, and if you look at, you know, this is, a lot of this is applying to um, the new media world that we live in today. Um, some of these things um, in different ways applied to the, to the traditional way, but it's when that transition occurred is when the whole world changed, right? Um, traditional media didn't understand what this was. They're dead in the water. If they're going to deal with these things, there's no way you know, the New York Times is going to survive if they have to figure out how to deal with this. There's just no way. Um, and so either they change what they do to be, you know, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to focus on small niche and we're going to focus on high quality and we're going to figure out how to plug into other people's media systems. If they do that, um, which is kind of what they did in the traditional media as well, then they might survive. If they want to be, you know, become bigger and do more of this kind of stuff, they're probably going to die because they don't have the expertise um, to do this kind of stuff. Um, so it's all AI in the end. I actually like this slide a lot. Um, I use it all the time, but it's kind of nice to see this. And a lot of us know what this is, but I think it's kind of nice to look at it. Um, you know, artificial intelligence, we know what that is. Um, that generates machine learning. Um, and, you know, that gives us NLP. And, you know, we, we got this problem called information retrieval, which now the world makes a lot of money off of. Um, and kind of the dash line represents that it's not actually a field of artificial intelligence. It's some field in general, and you can apply artificial intelligence to it, and that's what actually made it work. That's what made it the, the regular user um, could actually see this actually working. Um, and information extraction, very, very important field. We all do that today. Information filtering is very much like information retrieval, but it hasn't had its killer app yet. It doesn't have web search, right? Information filtering is like personalization, right? I wake up in the day and, you know, there's all this information that I want. Tell me what I should look at right this second. Um, and that, that essentially gives you recommender systems, right? So and there's many more arrows, um, but it's kind of nice to, to look at this. Um, so media equals information filtering to me. Um, so the media problem is essentially implicit search. Um, users don't have the time or skills to find what they want. Their intentions are implicit. Even if you ask them at any point in time, they wouldn't know what to say in terms of what they want to do next. Um, and there's way too much to go looking through um, to figure this out. So how do you solve for this? First thing is you need to understand your audience, right? If you don't understand them, then you know, you're almost like them. You don't know what the hell you're doing. Um, you need to understand your content. Otherwise, you can't figure out how to filter it, obviously. Um, and then you need to match these things together, right? Um, that's the critical three things. So how do newspapers do this? Um, so um, they, you know, they collect or generate high quality content. This is one of the, this is the best thing that they did. In fact, they're quality machines, um, most of them. Um, and they decide what you need and want to know. And that, that's actually an extremely important function that the media does, right? This is what journalism is teaching you these two things. What do people need to know? And separately, what do they want to know? And they're definitely different. And journalism spends a lot of time on need, 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 need. What do you need to know? And let's make sure we give that to our public because we're educating them. That's, that's the whole point of journalism. Um, and that's part of what media is. Um, what you want to know was also we should do that for you. Um, you don't really need to know what the sports score was last night, but we know you want to know it. So we'll create a section. We'll put that in there. Um, but you know, it's hardly ever on the front pages. You don't need to know this. That's kind of the idea. And then they optimize the content um, and the layout to drive subscriptions, because at the end of the day, they need to make money. Um, and so they actually do this, and then they do this thing every single day. Um, so you know, they get to work very early, and they sit in a big newsroom, and everyone throws all the stories up on a board, and they say, let's do this, 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 and let's put them in this way and organize that way. And you know, boom, the decisions are made, and, and the newspaper goes out the door, um, either the night before the day or, or however it, it, it may or may work for that particular um, title. So digital is different, and it's obvious, but um, digital is not like newspapers or, or other periodicals. They're updated many times an hour. Um, there's no way you can meet in a room and decide what to do. Um, the cost per update is free. I don't need to go run all this stuff on a big, huge press that takes forever. 
Um, space is almost unlimited. It's actually not unlimited because of user time. Um, and it's an order of magnitude change in scale on every other variable you want to go measure. Um, so in that way, it's very, very, very different. And it leads to the scale problem that I talked about before. Um, obviously, it's impossible to lay out digital in the same manner. You can't do it. Um, what do you do? Instead, you program it. Right? That's what we do. So instead of deciding what goes into each spot, um, you decide the function that goes into each spot, essentially. Right? You program what goes into different places. Um, so, for example, at Yahoo, um, if you say, well, how do they do this stuff? Well, they, they first understand all the stuff that they have. So they ingest it, they standardize it, they categorize it, they semantically tag it. Now they kind of know what's available, right? And, and most of this is automated. Otherwise, otherwise you, can't, you can't do it. Um, and then they have some tool. So there's some people who sit around, right? And actually, many of the people who do this today are actually were, were in these journalism teams, you know, 10 years ago. And they were actually building these newspapers a long time ago. And now they're here. Now they're doing this. Um, so pages are represented by Notion's conceptual slots. Um, and we assign some notion of a query to each slot, saying this is what we kind of content we want in that slot. And then these queries are interesting, right? They can leverage metadata. They're much, much better than like, um, you know, your web search. They're very interesting. And solving that problem is also an interesting subproblem. How, how do you deal with all these interesting queries? Um, and then they store all the content somewhere and they go query it real time, right? Um, so it's kind of nice. It works at scale. Um, and then they have these dashboards, which is the key thing that makes it work. Um, that reports all the performance, all these things real time. So we know what's working and what's not working. Um, and then they can use that to reprogram the sites however they want to. So they go, oh my God, um, there was an earthquake somewhere and now we need to organize things in a different way to handle that. So we can do that you know, real time. So in five minutes, everything's reorganized. Um, it makes it, it's a pretty damn scalable system actually. Um, so what's wrong with this thing? It has lots of problems. So this type of solution is, is you'll see it everywhere, you know, Huffington Post and, and other places, and it's old. It's about 10 years old at least now. Um, so it has lots of problems. These queries are programmed by humans manually. They have no idea how that affects the ecosystem. They have no way to know. The only way they can know is if they do something and then go look at the feedback and they go, oh, maybe I should change it. Maybe go look at the feedback, right? This, this is no good. They're not, they're not going to be able to optimize the entire set of media that they're, they're overlooking in this way. It's not focused on the user. You can only have one query, let's call it, per slot for all users, right? I mean, there's only one front page and there's all these billions of users, but I, I only program it one way. Just like the newspaper, they still essentially um, would look at it this way. Um, it's not dynamic because um, I can't really change all these queries on demand or even quickly, right? There's literally Essentially, there's millions of these queries that, that are all over the place. Um, you can't go change all of them, right? So things not dynamic. Um, and it's not flexible. Um, so you can literally, because humans do this, it can only be done in a way that a human would do it. So they can't do something that a machine might want to do because the machine doesn't get to write the queries. Um, so it's not very flexible either. So um, when you look at the original solution, it looks kind of nice. When you look at all the problems with it, it looks really bad, right? But a while, when they first created the system like that, they didn't realize that these would be important. Um, but they are. So how do we fix it? So we do the things I already said. We understand our audience, understand our content, and we match things, but we change the problem slightly. We don't understand our audience, we understand our users. That's the critical, fundamental change, which leads to the scale up. Um, and then you need to optimize your matching automatically, because once I go to users, I can no longer do manual. Done. That whole system has to go in the bin, there is no manual done. Everything has to be automatic. Everyone, everything has to be optimized. So now it becomes a totally different problem. It just made a small little pivot and becomes totally different. So the solution for this is, is whatever you want. Um, I might call it personalized content recommendation. And so you see what I'm trying to say is that it's a requirement now. It's no, it's no longer is personalization good. It's, it's the only way through. It's the only way to get to a system that's fully optimized at the scale. So um, very briefly, um, so at, at Yahoo, what, what are we doing at a high level? So you know, we're building this system, essentially, right? um, which is actually running today on the front page. You can see the results. Um, you know, we do some content understanding. We understand our content. Um, we, we understand our users down there, number two. Um, from understanding that, we put those into some databases. Right? We call one a user profile database, um, another one some index to store all the content. 
and that goes into some other box number three, which, which does the matching, right? All the matching happens there. Um, and anything that comes out of number three gets um, you know, requested from the users in the front end, right? these front end services. Um, and there's users over there, and they're asking that box, um, essentially, what should I look at next? What should I look at next? What should I look at next? And every single thing that they do is fed down this dotted line into the systems, into understanding the users as well as understanding the content. Because whatever the users do um, helps me understand both them and the content. I know more about the content and the user together. And it's these, right, this is obviously critical. That's going to help me figure out what I should do next. Right? Um, so essentially, that's you know, the, the high level architecture. Um, it's totally conceptual. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about, about all these things, one, two, three. Um, so first of all, what is kind of personalization? What does it mean? What does it look like? Well, um, anyway, the way that I look at it, the way that I define it is, you know, really the user comes and uses the system and we look at, we look at what we've given them. So in this case, we look at, you know, kind of the entities we've given them. Um, and we look at kind of sources that we've given them, right? And we look at the categories of stuff that we've given them. Um, and we even look at all the keywords that they've read and interacted with in whatever way. Um, and then after that, you know, um, the users just use the product. They don't know that I'm looking at all this stuff. And the system just profiles what they're doing based on all these interactions, right? And then it uses that to recommend um, content. It can optimize ranks and layouts, and it can even change the UI, do all sorts of different stuff. Um, sometimes the users even might declare that they like or they don't like something. And it's extremely important to get this information it's also even more important to do it in a way that's, that isn't, that's not interrupting their normal use case, which is using the product. So you don't want them to have to. So you guys have used lots of personalization products, I bet. Um, and one of the things that many of them do will say, hey, you can't use my product until you tell me what you like. That's, that's not good. First of all, people don't necessarily even know what they like. And maybe they might know what they like today, but they forgot that they, oh, they like this thing you know, that they were doing last week. They don't remember that. And so now you don't know about it, and now that system will never know because it just uses declared interest. So asking people up front what they like is both obtrusive, people don't like it, plus it's not complete. It's an interesting bootstrap, though. Um, so kind of that's how I look at personalization. Um, but what we want is dynamic personalization. So um, we want to um, essentially look at you know, what you like that's different than, than everything else. So a lot of these systems will look at like things that are trending or the most popular things are kind of the mean or the middle. You know, um, this is kind of what everybody likes. But personalization really is looking at the differences between those. So um, what is different? And let's focus on those things and let's figure out how we can give you that. Um, we can do popular. Popular is easy to do. It's easy to do at scale. And it's also reasonably easy to blend that in. So once I know what makes you different, then I can figure out, hey, you should look at the trending stuff as well. That's a nice way to, to look at it. And personalization is about more than just kind of like the topics you like, which is what most people think of. Um, some people just like popular things, actually. So we looked at you know, this huge distribution of what users are looking at, and a large number of people have no individual interests. They literally just read what's popular. Why? Um, maybe they only like that. Um, more likely, it's because they don't have enough time. So they want to get through all the popular stuff, and when they're done, they're done. Now they've got to go back to whatever tasks they were doing. They don't have any time to get into the individual stuff, perhaps. Um, nonetheless, this is the case. Um, some users like short articles, some users like funny articles, some users like the UI set up in a certain way. So you want to be able to learn all this stuff that makes the user different and you want to show it to them. Something I don't mention, I think, in slides, the other key thing is to tell them that you're doing that. If you don't tell them, they won't notice. Um, and actually, they won't be as happy, it turns out. So if you give you know, the same person um, the same three articles, and in one case you tell him why you did it, and in the other case you didn't, he's actually much more happier in the case when you told him. Um, and it's, it's, it's proven over and over and over and over. Even though they get the same experience, they're happy that you're doing the right thing. Um, so content understanding. I've been doing this for, for forever years um, at Yahoo. I won't go into anything about it, but this is kind of you know, a kind of high level of what basically we're, we're doing. We're processing the content. We understand the structure of all the different types of things, even video. Um, we understand all the entities. We know where they are in the real world. Um, we're looking at you know, various summaries of them um, in terms of the entities or the actual text itself. Um, and we do all sorts of categorization and clustering in many, many, many different ways. Um, many of them are linked together. And then all sorts of different things around relatedness, how topics think of building a big, huge topic graph and, and content graph and all the different graphs about you know, men and women, which types of content do they like. 
So do all sorts of content understanding like this. Um, every single thing here is online, which is kind of surprising perhaps to some of us. Like, you know, clustering isn't something that we would think of as, as doing online. But here, of course, we're required to do everything online, so everything is online. Um, everything happens very quickly within milliseconds. Um, so now we've done all that stuff. And now that goes in the index, and so now we want to understand the users. Um, so for the users, we have some notion of conceptual representation. So we understand the topics you like. Um, we look at your tendencies. You know, do you like niche things? It's a very interesting feature, it turns out. Um, it doesn't even matter necessarily what the topic is. If you like niche stuff, um, you tend to be a very particular type of user, which lets you do different things, like help them discover more stuff. Um, properties of the user that they may have intrinsically turns out to be a very useful thing to do when you don't have a lot of data. Um, the other thing is kind of, so these are kind of the conceptual representation, and then there's this sort of value representation. So what do you record about all these things, right? Um, so um, again, recording a uniqueness to a user at a given time of one of these types of things, for example, the topics that make you unique is something you can do. Um, you can think of some of this um, as like the sketches that we were talking about earlier, right? You don't want to record everything about the user, and I got so many users, and I got to copy this all over the world. Um, I got to choose what my sketch is, but the sketch doesn't have necessarily a direct single thing. Like I don't just want to know what user is missing. I want what number is missing, right? From the earlier talk. I want to know about the whole distribution, right? That means I can't just store one number. And it means that there isn't a globally best solution either. There's a set of them essentially and they may change dynamically over time. So it's a very tricky problem, very tricky type sketch type thing. Um, you can record the overall activity. You can focus on collaborative factors. There's Many different values you might record um, for these particular conceptual things. Um, and then many different dimensions. So you might want to do this in the short term, in the medium term, in the long term. You might want to do it in subspaces, like just for phrases, just for entities. You might want to do it for you know, just women, just men, just this, just that. So you may want to do this many, many, many times in many different ways um, for every single user, um, or even segments of users in that case. So you can see the space and the complexity can get um, Pretty, pretty tricky. Um, and then we need to have some sort of cold start strategy for sure, otherwise we can't get users using the system. The other thing that's critical is this explore exploit strategy. Essentially you can't build a good personalized system unless you're exploring, exploring all the time, it turns out. So um, I know today that um, you like, I don't know, um, you like, I don't know, the Detroit Red Wings, right? Um, but I don't know whether you, know, you like someone else, I don't know, like, um, the fly guys, right? Um, do you like these guys? Um, I don't know, I need to explore that. But to do that, I need to understand my space because I need to understand that I want to explore another sport team, I might want to explore another hockey team, I want to choose one that's locally in geo close to the one that you already like. Maybe you like certain types of entities and players and maybe they're linked to that team as well. So my explore strategy has to be very good because there's just way too many things for me to figure out about you. And so I need to choose what I test you on very explicitly. And then I need to set up an experiment where I actually go through some recommendation and watch what you're doing and based on that record new information. And then I move forward and do it again. Um, so it becomes very, it's almost like a one-on-one um, -on -one interview of the system with the user back and forth trying to figure out what they're interested in. And it helps them learn things about themselves. Um, so personalization metrics, um, without metrics you can't really do a good job of anything. Um, so what is a good measure of engagement? Um, click behavior is what most people look at, it turns out it's not a very good metric at all for the personalization problem. Um, time spent scrolling, reading, hovering, these are all very, very, these have a lot more information than clicks. Um, number of visits and sessions is, is also very good to look at. Some long-term measure of all these things is also extremely valuable. Um, if you look at just personalization, things like number of topics consumed, that is if I had a totally non-personalized system and then the next day I gave you a new one, you would expect that over time, hopefully you can consume more topics because I'm giving you more things that are individual to you. And so you'll start to begin to read about more things than you would in a non-personalized system. Um, same sort of thing, number of non-popular topics consumed, you hope in a personalized system this goes up. You're, you're delivering a more diverse set to a user and then you're delivering a more diverse set across the population. There's many other types of, of metrics you might look at for just personalization um, and, and some of these actually do work. Um, and then you want to optimize these targets. So um, at the end of the day, it's kind of like, what is a good click? Um, so you want to assign credit to individually predicted 
you know, objects or recommendations and what did the user do to it in some way? Um, is that a positive or a negative thing? Um, and how does that correlate with kind of my long-term goals? Um, and how do I train a machine to actually figure out how to do that more often? Um, so this becomes extremely important. Um, so um, these are kind of interesting. Um, they're actually, in many ways, unsolved problems. Um, so how do we separate interest based on activities from casual browsing? Um, so I read an article about that, um, Harlem Shake, and I'm not actually interested in Harlem or shaking, right? Um, this is some meme that, I, that I'm not even interested in either. I just want to read it now. It's an extremely short-term interest of maybe, you know, hopefully you got over it within 10 minutes and you never did it again. Um, maybe you did it a week. Um, but nonetheless, I don't, I don't want to record this stuff. Maybe I do want to record the, like, memes, right? That's a wholly different kind of semantic that I have to be able to get as well. Um, then you have, you know, taxes, and this is short-term and long-term, and yeah, you're not really interested in taxes per se, but you, you need them during a certain time period in your life, so you've got to deal with them at that point. Um, you've got the breaking news problem. Um, you have this bottom problem, which is the, the hardest one, um, which is, is non-click indicative of lack of interest. It's absolutely not. Um, in fact, if you, you know, just, just watch yourself, you know, I don't know, go, go to the front page of Yahoo, in fact, today, and go read the articles um, in the stream that, that you get, um, and see, and go through and see, hey, how much value am I getting out of these articles that I don't read? How much value am I getting out of the ones that I actually click on and read? Um, it turns out they're very similar. So I get a lot of value out of not clicking because I got everything I needed, and I get sometimes less value, even more value, out of clicking. Um, so actually, clicks are not very interesting in general, um, though they provide some signal. Um, the last thing, quickly, is sort of the, the last box, so um, the actual recommendation. So now I, I kind of understand my users. They're super complex to figure out. My content is a little bit easier to figure out. I know how to do that, and now I have to figure out how to jam them together. Um, so search and recommendation, um, they're different, right? So we talked about before. Information retrieval is where I totally understand what the user wants. Um, I know what his intent is. He gave me a query, and, and he's asking for information right now. So I can solve that problem. Recommendation is not. I don't know. I, even the user doesn't know what they want. I definitely don't know what they want. There's no query. They're kind of in a browsing mood. It's totally push-based. Um, it's a different beast altogether. Um, so recommendations, you basically need to produce a list of recommendations. The idea is probably not focused on one thing either. And you know, it's kind of a diverse set of interesting stuff. Um, you need to understand a user to be able to do it. Two main approaches, really. Things based on content, things based on collaboration. Um, so not so much directly on the content. Um, you can implement actually either of these in a search engine, it turns out. So you can reuse the same infrastructure, which is you know, the bottom level of the three things you have to do. Um, and not so interesting necessarily to go through all these slides, but yeah, I need to build a user profile. I need to build content profiles. Um, I need to build an index over this thing. And I need to query it and deliver the results, right? This is what I'm doing for a content-based thing, very similar. Um, recommender problem, probably everyone here knows about recommendation problems in general, but basically you're trying to predict some response, some metric um, of the user um, for an item that I give them. So I have a user U and I have an item I and I want to know what they're going to do with it. Um, and if I can do that very well, then I know what to give them. Um, so that's the idea. So um, collaborative methods are one way to attack this problem as well. There's neighborhood methods. When I look at the neighborhood of the content around the content you've already looked at or the users that are similar to you, and predict things, or I can do latent factor models, which, which I, I prefer, um, where I represent user and items by these hidden factors. Um, and it's these hidden factors that I learn based on an actual um, training set. So the top things are, are not normally ever optimized. They're kind of hacky scoring methods at best. Um, so um, probably don't really want to go through the factor model, but at the end of the day, there's Q factors and P factors. One represents the items, one represents the users. I learn them and I use them to predict your rating. Um, one of the big problems with this guy is that it doesn't handle the cold start problem well. Um, so this is a problem for us. Um, so you can get a bit trickier and do the same sort of thing, um, except that now these factors are, um, can be predicted using a regression model. The regression model takes the input of features on the user and the content. Um, so now I can actually do cold start because I know who you are, I have features about you, and therefore I can predict what your factors are. And since I have your factors, now I can do recommendation for you. Done. Um, same, same with the content. I can do similar stuff. So this turns out to be very handy um, to solve some of the problems. 
Um, last two slides, um, recommendation challenges. Um, so lots of users and items with significant variance. That is, I have large portions of the users in different pieces of distribution. Um, Got to use different strategies. Um, it's expensive to consider all items all the time. Um, have to figure out how to do that. New items are arriving all the time very quickly. Have to deal with that problem. Have to do some incremental stuff. And the space of interest that I need to recommend things within is also very large. It's also very dynamic. The things that you're interested in, like Harlem Shake, didn't exist ever for 50,000 years. And now it exists, and then it goes away 10 minutes later. Right? Um, so it's a very, very tricky challenge. Um, and that's really it, I think. Thanks, guys. <laughs>